today, I thought that we would keep it a little bit lighthearted, but take a look at the overall music industry as it stands today. Where are we? And I put it in the context of the music industry hunger games, winners and losers. So welcome to the music industry hunger games, where the music industry combatants vie bravely for the piece of an ever shrinking pie. Um, you may recognize this quote from Hunter S. Thompson. How many people have seen this quote before? Um, the music business is a cruel and shallow money trench, a long plastic hallway where thieves and pimps run free and good men die like dogs. There's also a negative side. Um, this quote from Hunter S. Thompson actually has become the description of the music industry. But never before has it been more appropriate than now, because it's the Wild West out there, folks. Uh, the difference between the old music business and the new one is quite stark, because technology has not only disrupted the traditional music business model, it has virtually subsumed it. At the turn of the last century, and that's the 20th century, um, it would have been difficult to imagine the YouTube explosion, the rapid ascendancy of mobile phone apps, the, their usage, their creation. And it would have been hard to imagine the impact that these disruptive technologies would have on the music industry as it now stands. Also, because this technological revolution occurred so quickly, with very little warning, in many cases, the law has yet to catch up to any meaningful degree. As a result of free streaming services and the advent of the cloud, illegal downloading has pretty much hit a wall. A study released in late 2013 by networking company Sandvine on internet traffic, they found that peer-to-peer -peer traffic is now below 10%. That's down 31% from five years ago and down 60% from 11 years ago. And the thought is that less P2P traffic translates to less piracy. And some reports are showing that as well. Um, and we can take a look at YouTube. Let's just take a look at YouTube. YouTube is now the go-to platform for consuming music for US teens, according to Nielsen's annual Music 360 report. There's more than 64% of teens consume their music that way. And it's free. On the losing side, it's no secret that the recording industry as we knew it is failing. The net value of pre-recorded music product as a standalone sales item is rapidly approaching statistically zero. CD sales have plunged by more than half from 2003 to the present. And the net value of the music industry itself is 50% of what it was in 2003. In fact, CD sales are down to just 30% of music industry sales revenues. The top 10 selling albums in the United States shifted 56.4 million units in the year 2000. But by 2013, the number shifted was 14.7 million units. So it's widely accepted at this point that such pre-recorded music <clears throat> products will never again regain any discrete monetary value based on individual or per unit sales. Unfortunately, <clears throat> standalone music product sales have been the core revenue stream for record labels since their inception, and this is no longer the case. Also, on the losing side, which is also a losing side for artists, we'll get to that, the steep decline in record sales, coupled with several major um, record label mergers that have occurred over the last 10 years, shrinking the industry, has caused record labels to not only terminate hundreds of recording artist agreements, but also has caused the major labels, and really any labels, to be extremely cautious and reluctant to sign agreements with new and untried artists. The technological methods that an artist must now master and employ the absence of a financial support structure, the economic education now required to keep track of revenues, and the social media acumen that's necessary for a musical artist to find her audience has created a new paradigm for both nation and established artist development. Mm -hmm. Let's start by saying this. The average mu musician is severely underemployed, um, which you probably can guess. 
But there was a musician survey that was conducted by the Future of Music Coalition, which by the way, if you want to get some interesting news, um, Future Music Coalition is a, is a lobbying organization essentially for recording artists' rights. They work also with low power FM radio and many other, issue, many other um, issues of the day, and they do a, a tremendous amount of research. So futureofmusic.org if you're interested in looking, looking at it. Um, um, but anyway, they conducted this survey and they found just 42% of musicians are working full-time in music. The rest are complementing their day jobs with, um, you know, other things that have little or nothing to do with music. And uh, worse, actually, musicians' salaries are intractably low. According to this FMC uh, survey, the average musician makes around $34,000 a year from music-specific gigs and with overall incomes, meaning music plus non-music incomes, averaging around 55,000. Um, let's talk about artists and the, and the record labels. Um, you know, I say here a few, far between and far reaching. Um, we know that the record labels are no longer expending large or even modest funds to support the artist, unless that artist has already proven herself to be viable in the marketplace. This creates a catch-22 for the recording artist, of course, as they now must gain a high level of visibility and viability in the marketplace on their own to potentially gain a label's financial and marketing support, which it may actually not need once they do gain this high visibility and viability. So it's kind of this weird catch-22. <laughs> But the issue really is that artists are forced to expend, generally, their personal funds to create the music product and, and on marketing. And since they must financially self-support, generally they will find themselves in a negative economic situation. Considering the huge upfront risk factors of releasing new music into the marketplace, this is a formidable obstacle for artists, and especially emerging artists with few resources to overcome. Um, not only that, in addition to financial self-support, um, each artist has to create their self-sustaining music industry business structures. Um, without record label support, they have to perform all the tasks that a record label normally would perform or even a publishing company normally would perform. Um, so these changed market conditions resulting from leveling requires artists to do two things create excellent music and a stellar live performance, but also become their own marketers and promoters and publishers and social media people and graphic artists and designers and audio engineers and producers. And unfortunately, as we probably find out on the back end, they practice law on their own and then we get the brunt of it, you know, fix it is always the thing and you look and you say, are you insane? Are you over 21? Well, what do you want me to do, you know? I mean, so it's a very difficult situation for the, these artists right now. And it's given this rise to sort of a jack of all trades, master of none crop of artists because you don't have time or the diligence to finally hone your art. the gig money myth. Everybody says, ah, touring money, it'll make up for it. We're losing money in CD sales, but we're gonna go on tour. We'll make a lot of money. No, that's just not the case. Uh, first of all, let me give you a, a little statistic here. Just 15% of people um, who are consumers of music regularly go to gigs. That's the way it is. And even for these consumers, live performance consumption is, in terms of total time spent, a, fall, a very small fraction of the music consumption. So the paradox is that artists still needing to make a recording in order to drive live and merchandise income, you know, it's, it's caught in this very odd kind of paradox. When you talk, take a look at the live music value chain here, it's an incredibly complicated uh, situation here. There are multiple stakeholders who take their share. There's the ticketing, there's the secondary uh, ticketing market, there's venues, there are booking agents, promoters, all sorts of people that are taking their piece. Um, so the share of live revenue that artists make from live performances has declined every year since the year 2000. And the secondary ticketing market is often fed before the actual ticketing market, thanks to things like bots and aggressive scalpers, um, or even the artists, um, or even the ticketing providers themselves. So um, again, it's, um, they cannibalize themselves. Um, as we probably know, knowing a lot of musicians, we know musicians play free shows, and a lot of them. 
But what's actually worse is for many venues, artists are now having to either pay to play the venues, actually give the venue owner money to play at that venue, or pre-sell a preset number of tickets in order to be able to play at that venue. So it's a pay to play situation. You can't make money that way gigging. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Um, so finally, fan funding, crowdfunding, tip jars. You know, Google, YouTube has a tip jar. If you want to tip your artist, that's there, it's in beta right now. You can actually tip an artist online and give them a couple of bucks if you want to do that. Um, you know, can I have some more, sir? Um, so crowdfunding, though, this fan funding, I think is a mixed bag of winning and losing. Yes. An artist can certainly raise funds for a new recording and maybe a tour, maybe make a music video. You can do that on Kickstarter, Indiegogo, any one of many of these. But the problem is that oftentimes the artist has no clear idea of what to actually do with those dollars, how to wisely spend those marketing dollars. And I have to say that 99% of that time they do not consider lawyer's fees in those dollars. And that's where they get bollocks up because there are contracts to be made and deals to be made and that's um, a problem. The other thing is I was talking to an artist who is a big YouTube artist. She has th really literally um, some of her videos have over three million hits and she plays the ukulele. Her name's Julia Nunes if you ever want to see somebody really fun who sings and she's just adorable. But I was on a panel with her and she was talking about the fact that she did not know how much it would cost her to send out all those CDs and t-shirts and little goodie bags that she promised all of her donors on the site. So she raised, let's say, I forget what the figure was, something like $30,000 to make a recording, but 5000 of it was spent on shipping and mailing. So artists are not necessarily the best handlers of income. And as we said before, Artists are getting left behind a little bit in these digital formats, but songwriters, they're really getting left behind um, on the digital formats. Um, uh, has anybody ever heard of Desmond Child? I picked up the Desmond Child has written a, a, so many major hits. Um, for instance, he wrote Living on a Prayer by Bon Jovi um, and so many other hits for so many artists uh, back in the 80s, but they're still played over and over again, these songs. And um, I found the statistic that he reported, I haven't know Desmond, so that's why I used him. Um, he reported more than six million plays on Pandora for Living on a Prayer, and his check was for $110. You can't live on that, folks. You know, um, another uh, songwriter that I know, Ellen Shipley, she wrote a great song called Ooh, Heaven is a Place on Earth. Um, she received $39 for more than 3.1 million plays on the same service. Um, so if the publishers get this opportunity to disengage from the PROs, the songwriter's shares may actually decline further. Um, because, as what I said, cross-collateralization and sometimes even net revenue models um, and no direct payment from the PRO. The other kinds of composers are library music composers. Do I, does any, I don't know if any of you work with library music composers who just sit all day in a recording studio and just churn out tracks and then they license bulk tracks. And what it was, these library music composers used to get public performance royalties. Um, but now there's the rise of this new RPF license, which is royalty performance free licenses. And they have emerged to further threaten um, these composers' existence. They depended on those performance royalties because they could create a track and it would be used over and over again by First National Bank in 300 different First National Bank commercials all over the United States. And they would get those public performance royalties. But now they're having to sign away those as well. They're also, in many cases, I hear the complaints, they're having to sign away their car copyrights as well. I mean, everything, just every kind of right you can imagine. So it's not very good um, for a small fee up front. Um, but there is a slight winning side here. Um, I, I saw that BMI uh, reported, I think it was last week or the week before, $977 million in revenue for its most recent fiscal year which is a 3.5% gain from the year before, 
And it's the most, actually, that this organization has collected in its 75-year history. And after subtracting all their administrative costs, BMI paid out more than $840 million in royalties to its members. Um, and again, we know that they have more than, way north of 500,000 songwriters and music publishers. That's about up 3.2% uh, from last year, and also that is a record for BMI as well. Um, so songwriters, I think, are, I think I would say that they're on the losing side right now. Again, it remains to be seen how they're going to come out. at this moment is considering creating what's known as the two-tiered internet, the fast lane and the slow lane. Fast lane for those that can pay, slow lane for those who cannot. Um, the ones in the fast lane will be the ones that can pay these oligopolistic telecommunications companies the toll, essentially. And they're lobbying virulently to see that this occurs. Um, this issue of net neutrality, I, I think, is a defining issue. Because, you know, the internet controls how we do everything, how we consume information, how we consume media and art, its necessity for our businesses. It's critical to how we innovate, how we communicate, how we learn, how we educate. Um, control of the internet is control of our minds. It is. And it's control of our world. So we have to really look at this situation of net neutrality, in other words, really leveling it out for all to be able to get on the internet and to innovate. Um, these, YouTube would never have happened had there been a fast lane or slow lane. Netflix never would have happened had there been a fast lane or slow lane. And so many other services that had to get onto the internet and innovate in order to be able to um, create a new model or a new business or a new uh, community in some cases. So this will affect songwriters and publishers and musicians and labels because the internet essentially is the portal for musicians, not to mention all other kinds of entertainment entrepreneurs. Both B2B sites and direct-to-fan sites hinge on the ability to offer, display, and deliver various types of content to users via the sites. So it would be disastrous, in my opinion, for musicians and music industry entrepreneurs, innovators, and other creators if telecoms are given the green light to create a free structure based on broadband usage, thereby essentially creating the internet into cable TV, which is what it could become. Um, so the standalone services are very vulnerable as well. And um, I, I think that net neutrality is something that everybody should look into, into if you are representing musicians or entertainment industry individuals or keep abreast of these situations as they unfold because they are unfolding um, rapidly and before our eyes. Um, so anyway, the law, as we know, is still being finely honed as a weapon here. And absent a coherent legal framework for any of these things, um, all the music industry participants really don't know where to go. I mean, essentially, the music industry hunger games, who are the winners, who are the losers? Right now, we really just don't know. So stay tuned, everybody. <laughs>